Starting at number 10, there are similarities with the purpose of prayer in each of these religions. So starting with Judaism, prayer builds the relationship between God and human beings. Well because when people pray, they spend time with God and to pray is to serve God with your heart. Instead of the religion of Islam, prayer keeps Muslims in touch with God and keeps Muslims constantly reflecting on their actions and assessing whether or not they're living true. At number 9, we have the command to pray. So praying isn't just an idea that Muslims and Jews just came up like, oh it's a good idea if I'm in the mood. Rather, it's actually a command and obligatory in both religions. In Judaism, prayer is seen as a service of the heart and it's a commandment based in the Torah. It's mandatory for both Jewish men and women. And the scripture often used for this is Deuteronomy 11 verse 13 which says, you shall serve God with your whole heart. And now in Islam, the command to pray is found in Surah 30, Aram 17 and 18. Some say that these only mention four prayer times, but the fifth time is said to be found in Hud 11 verse 104 which says, and establish prayer at the two ends of the day and at the approach of the night. Jews and Muslims also pray directly to God. So in prayer, each individual Muslim and Jew has direct contact with God. There's no need for a priest or any other type of intermediary, it's just you and God. Although yes, there are prayer leaders and people of religious authority, but they're not to be viewed as intermediaries at all, but rather they're just people who may have greater knowledge and understanding of the particular faith. You can also find call to prayers in Judaism and Islam as well. In Islam we have the Azan and that's the call to worship and it's recited in a melodious way. Allah Akbar The main purpose behind the Azan is to make an easy summary of the Islamic beliefs really available to everyone as well as a daily reminder for Muslims to pray. The Azan goes as follows, God is the greatest and that's repeated four times. I bear witness that there is no Lord except God and that's repeated twice. I bear witness that Muhammad is a messenger of God and that's repeated twice. Make haste towards prayer, also repeated twice. Make haste towards success, repeated twice. God is the greatest, that's also repeated twice. And the final line is only repeated once and that says there is no Lord except God. Now for Jews, in the past Jews would use a ram's horn. <laughs> However, nowadays, what is called the Bar Chu is conducted as a part of the Jewish prayer service and it serves as a call to prayer. The call to prayer consists of a Jew who is vocally trained called a Chazan and he calls out bless the Lord the blessed one and then the congregation responds and says bless is the Lord the blessed one forever and ever and then the Chazan repeats the congregation's part. There's also a similarity with prayer time. So Jews are supposed to pray three times a day, morning, afternoon and evening and praying regularly enables a person to really build a closer relationship with God and Muslims you know they pray five times a day. The Salat is the second of the five pillars of Islam and it's observed at five different times of the day. Yeah, morning, afternoon, late afternoon, evening and night. You'll also find similar prayer positions, standing, sitting, bowing and prostration. Prostration is not as common in Judaism but certain groups like the Ashkenazi Jews, they regularly prostrate themselves in prayer. There's also what I call main prayers. So inside of Judaism there's this Shema and it's the most important prayer in Judaism and it's recited often multiple times a day and this reaffirms the Jewish people to their faith of Judaism. And it 
goes as follows. Hear, O Israel, Adonai is our God, Adonai is one. And by the way, Adonai translates to the Lord in English, so you could also say it like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And in Islam, it's the Shahada, and the Shahada sums up Islam in one single prayer. Ashhadu an la ilaha As well as being a statement of faith, recitation of the Shahada is also required for any that wants to convert to the religion and they gotta believe it as well. And it goes as follows, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Number three, they share the direction that they face. Well, they don't actually share the direction that they face in prayer, but for Jews, it's customary that they face towards the east. However, they don't actually necessarily have to face the east. They just face the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and depending on your location it could be in the east. Muslims all around the world they face the Kaaba in the city of Mecca when they perform their prayers. It also unites Muslims from all around the world in their worship of God despite their cultural racial differences. And number two we have washing before prayer. So in Judaism ritual washing or ablution of full body immersion as well as washing the hands exists. A person should wash their hands before prayer and the term in Hebrew is netilat yadaim which is the washing of hands with a cup. Before praying Muslims Muslims wash their hands, face, head, and feet, and this washing ablution is called wudu. And the purpose is to physically purify yourself, but it also symbolizes spiritual purity as well. And the final similarity I want to share with you is the similarity of public prayers. So Muslims can pray anywhere, but there are added benefits to pray with others in a mosque. Praying together in a congregation helps Muslims to realize that everyone is equal, and it's an opportunity to remain united in the faith. Jews are also invited to go to the synagogue to pray but can pray anywhere also. It really helps to build togetherness within the Jewish community locally and around the world. So let's just jump in. Starting at number 10 we have the multiple names of God. In the Torah you'll find multiple names attributed to God. There's Yahweh spelled Y-H-W-H. Then there's the name El, Elohim, El Shaddai, which means God Almighty. And now there are many other names in the rest of the Hebrew Bible. These are just some common ones that appear in the Torah. As for the Quran, of course, there is Allah, which is Arabic equivalent to God in English. There's also As Salam, there's Al Aziz, Al Malik, Al Khalik, and many others. So, as you see, in both the Torah and the Quran, there's multiple names attributed to God. And in both the Quran and Torah, God doesn't have one one specific name. The similarity at number nine is that it's believed that they were revealed to people and they actually mentioned this. So in the Torah, first up, there are several questions of who wrote the Torah that still come up. But generally, the Torah is attributed to Moses. However, scholars say that only portions of the Torah can be specifically traced to Moses himself. Like there's an example in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 34 verses 1 to 8, Moses dies there. But the general held view is that the five books of the Torah were revealed to Moses and then somebody else probably just finished it all up. I'll actually be mentioning some scriptures later on in this episode that point to specific statements in the Torah that it was Moses that wrote it. But I'll save those for later, so stick around guys, I'll get there soon. As for the Quran, you can find in Surah 47 verses 2 this passage here. And those who believe and do righteous deeds and believe in what has been sent down upon Muhammad, and it is the truth from their Lord, he will remove from them their misdeeds and amend their condition. So as you can see, the Quran mentioned to Prophet Muhammad by name that the words of the Quran were revealed to him. Number eight is the Quran and Torah recount the creation story. The book of Genesis or Bereshit as it's known in the Hebrew language which means in the beginning literally opens up with that exact statement and then from verse one it continues to tell the whole story of creation that happens within six days. Now in the Quran you can find in Surah 7 verses 54 it says indeed your Lord is Allah who created the heavens and earth in six days 
and then establish himself above the throne. He covers a night with the day, another night chasing it rapidly, and he created the sun, the moon, and the stars subjected by his command. Unquestionably, his is the creation and the command. Blessed is Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Similarity number seven are the prophecies. According to Jewish tradition, the Torah is filled with prophecies of future events. Now, one of the most important ones being the coming of a prophet, who in most traditions is synonymous with the Messiah. You can find that in the book of Deuteronomy 18 verses 15 where it says the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you from your fellow Israelites you must listen to him now with the Quran it's also viewed by Muslims as a prophetic book filled with many different prophecies one of the prophecies are of a devastating group of people that are going to be released and cause havoc. You can find this in the Quran Surah 21 verses 97. It says, but when Yajuj and Majuj are let loose and they rush headlong down every hill. By the way, we've made episodes about Yajuj and Majuj and the prophecies in the Quran. So if you haven't seen those, definitely check them out. We go into a lot of detail in those episodes. But moving on to number six, we have they both recognize the Torah as being given by God. Now the Torah is mentioned in the Quran. It says, Lo, we have revealed the at Torah, wherein is guidance and a light by which the prophets who surrendered under Allah judge the Jews, and the rabbis and the priests judge by such of Allah's scriptures as they were bidden to observe, and thereunto were they witnesses. So fear not mankind, but fear me, and barter not my revelations for a little gain. Whoso judgeth not by that which Allah hath revealed, such are disbelievers. And that's found in Surah 5 verses 44 of the Quran. Now in the Torah, specifically it says in the book of Numbers, chapter 9 verses 23, at the Lord's command they encamped and at the Lord's command they set out. They obeyed the Lord's order in accordance with his command through Moses. Also in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4 verses 45, it says, these are the stipulations, decrees, and laws Moses gave them when they came out of Egypt. And by the way, the term Torah uh, it means the teachings. So that's pretty much summed up in Deuteronomy 4 verses 45. Like here's a bunch of different teachings that God revealed through Moses to share to the children of Israel. We got a lot more information to talk about. We're just halfway in. But the similarity at number five is the world is destroyed in both the Quran and the Torah. The Quran has an entire chapter called Nu, and it speaks of the prophet Noah, where he speaks of a great flood that wiped out humanity at one point in history. In Surah 71 of the Quran, specifically in verses 25 to 26, it says this, because of their sins, they were drowned and put into the fire and they found not for themselves besides Allah any helpers. And Noah said, my Lord, do not leave upon the earth from among the disbelievers an inhabitant. Now over in the Torah, the account of the flood is found in the book of Genesis, chapter six to nine. And in chapter seven, verses 23, it specifically says every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out people and animals and the creatures that moved along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth only Noah was left and those with him in the ark the waters flooded the earth for a hundred and fifty days another surprising similarity between the Quran and the Torah is that spirit beings are identified in both of them so the cherubim are the most frequently occurring heavenly creatures that are found in the Hebrew Bible. As a matter of fact, that word appears 91 times in the Hebrew Bible. But the first occurrence of the term cherubim is found in the Torah in the book of Genesis chapter 3 verses 24. And it, and it goes like this. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the Tree of Life. Now, when we look at the Quran, we see that the jinn are mentioned in it. In Surah 72 verses 1, it says, Say, O Muhammad, it has been revealed to me that a group of the jinn listened and said, Indeed, we have heard an amazing Quran. Also, the Quran mentions angels. There's a passage in Surah 13 verses 11 that says, For each one, are successive angels before and behind him who protect him by the decree of Allah. Similarity number three is the Quran and Torah identify Israel as special. 
The children of Israel have a special status and it's mentioned in the Quran, Surah 2 verses 47. It says, O children of Israel, remember my favor that I have bestowed upon you and that I preferred you over the worlds. Now over in the Torah, it says in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 2, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, the Lord has chosen you to be his treasured possessions. Similarity number two also sort of ties into some of the previous similarities, but the Ten Commandments are mentioned in both the Torah and the Quran. In the book of Exodus specifically, you can find the Ten Commandments listed in the Torah in the book of Exodus chapter 20, and it's also repeated in Deuteronomy. Now for the Quran, it doesn't list them out in order like the Torah does specifically, but the elements that make up the Ten Commandments are actually found throughout the Quran. You'll find literally almost exactly word for word the Ten Commandments as they're listed in the Torah. Now, the final similarity Ooh. at number one in this episode is God is referred to in plural. Now, this is a big one. So in the book of Genesis chapter one, it says, in the beginning, God created, and the word for God in the Hebrew is the word Elohim, which is a plural word. Also in the book of Genesis chapter one, verses 26, it says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So here we see God speaking in the plural because only God is the creator. Now, some scholars say that it's not that God is speaking in the plural, but rather that plural language is used in order to stress the power of God. The common Christian belief, on the other hand, is that this alludes to the Trinity. Similar language is found in the Quran in Surah 50 verses 16. It says, and we have already created man and know what his soul whispers to him. And we are closer to him than his jugular vein. One explanation according to Muslim theology is that this also stresses the power of God and does not suggest that there are two gods at all and that when the Arabic text is translated into English, the plural form is used as there is no exact equivalent to the Arabic text. So let's get right into it. The first similarity I want to share is Abraham. Abraham is an important figure in all three religions. That's why you may often hear Christianity, Judaism, and Islam referred to as Abraham. Abrahamic religions. According to the Bible, Abraham and his son Ishmael are said to be the founding fathers of the Arabic people in which Islam stemmed out of. Abraham and his other son Isaac, who he had with his wife Sarah, are said to be the founding fathers of the Jewish nation. Jesus, who Christians claim to be God in human form, was born out of the Jewish nation. So that's where that similarity comes from. The next thing is Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are also monotheistic religions. All of them claim to worship the true God of creation who is all-powerful and controls the universe. They share the common belief of the oneness of God which is what the term monotheism means. Now, the view of God does vary in the sense that Muslims and Jews believe that God is one, singular. Christians, on the other hand, believe God is one, but in the compounding sense of the term. What I mean by that is one made up of multiple entities, like in the case of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, each of them having different roles, but still pointing to one God. Another similarity is the belief in the supernatural guidance of history as well well as God being very active throughout human history in his interactions with human beings. An example of this would be God inspiring new prophets to share messages with people, God giving people visions, God sending angels, etc all to reveal things to humans that impact the course of humanity. Now the next similarity ties into the previous one. All these three religions stress moral responsibility and accountability of human beings and that there will actually be a judgment day where everyone will either be given an eternal reward or a punishment. They all emphasize their special covenant or promise with God. For Judaism, the covenant was made through Moses. In Christianity, it was made through Jesus, and in Islam, it was through the prophet Muhammad. Christianity accepts God's covenant made to the Jews, but generally believe it was superseded with the coming of Jesus. That's why you'll hear Christians speak of the New Covenant or the New Testament. Similarly, in Islam, Muslims recognize Judaism and Christianity. However, Islam is believed to supersede all those others and invite Jews and Christians to believe as they do. They share a common belief also in all, if not most, of the biblical prophets from Adam, Abraham, 
Moses, Jesus, you name it, as well as King David, King Solomon, and others who are not necessarily prophets like Mary, the mother of Jesus. The scriptures of the three Abrahamic religions also have similarities too. The Jewish holy book consists of the Tanakh and the Talmud. Christians adopted the Tanakh for their Bible, but it's called the Old Testament. Now the Quran also tells similar stories like the crucifixion of Jesus. However, it's told differently, and Muslims believe that the scriptures of the Jews and Christians were corrupted, and the Quran has the most accurate narrative of similar stories like the crucifixion of Jesus that's found in the New Testament of the Christian Bible. Pilgrimages are another similarity. So Mecca, of course, in Islam, that's the famous death destination for Muslims and doing a pilgrimage to Mecca is called Hajj, which is one of the pillars of Islam. Jews journey to Jerusalem, the holiest city for them, and Roman Catholics journey to Santiago de Compostela. Peace is also a central concept of all three religions. This is reflected historically in their use of similar greetings, all meaning peace be upon you. There's Shalom Aleichem in Judaism, there's Pax Vobi in Christianity and Salam Alaikum in Islam. Oftentimes though, the greetings of peace are used mainly just to refer to the members of one's own faith community. You wouldn't be going around and saying that to every single person that you meet. They also share belief in common specific names for God. So Muslim use the Arabic term Allah that refers generally to God. There's also a list of 99 other names and each of them describe a characteristic of God. The 100th name though is said to be unspeakable. Similarly, Christians and Jews also have specific names for their God like Elohim or Yahweh. However, those names are often seen as too holy to speak. So many versions of the Bible will replace those names with just general words like Lord or God. <laughs>